Okay, we should be on. Yay, all right, good. So um, today I'm going to continue teaching a little bit about this coronavirus, but I'm going to be uh, teaching more about uh, my own teaching. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a process of understanding the side of society when it comes down to understanding the avatar or Christ. And it's very different than uh, all the things that are said about the avatar of Christ, like religions, whether it be Hindu religions of the avatar Krishna, Rama, any of those, Shiva, or the Hebrew religion of relationship to Adam, Abraham, Moses, all of that. You know, it's an interpretation. It's not necessarily the all-out truth. There may be the truth is there, but it's how it's interpreted. So then there's the process of uh, uh, my life in this life, what have I been doing, and the influence of what that has been doing for humanity. And there's a, a great deal of change that's gone on in humanity since the year 2000. And uh, from the year 2000 on, uh, and the year 2000, I was enthroned. And prior to that, I went through uh, 40 years of an enormous amount of um, uh, processes to help society in places that they didn't know they needed help. Uh, during the Vietnam War, I had to join the war for four years and uh, in order to end the war. So I literally had to be in it and meditate and be of service. So I was uh, like a RN and I only worked in uh, hospitals in California and I furthered the science of medicine and a whole bunch of things. So my process during that time was to bring about um, healing you know, to the world rather than war. So that was my day-to-day -day reality. I was bringing about uh, newer and better sciences that would uh, take place in society. I began changing how hospital curriculum uh, ER and emergency and ambulances. I got rid of ambulances and I established ER and emergency uh, technology or emergency technicians where we have uh, ER uh, vans now rather than uh, ambulances where it's just people who know how to drive like a taxi driver and they pick you up and take you to the hospital. That's how it was when I entered medicine. So everything that was going on, I altered it. I altered how we work through surgery. I altered how uh, the um, sterile field was developed inside of the system of science, uh, you know, the IV bottle and all of that. I changed all that. Uh, how we deal with um, uh, checking out a person's vital symptoms. I added technology to it. I brought in uh, technology to monitor the blood pressure and monitor the heart rate and monitor vital systems so that we didn't depend on someone coming in every hour to check vital signs when a person had already died or their symptoms had gone down very low and there was no way for us to really know that was going on. So that bothered me. All that bothered me. Yeah. So I spent my time fixing uh, the whole area of medicine and science for four years and I ended the war at the end of my time in, uh, during the Vietnam War. 1973 the war ended, 1973 uh, so did my term in, in, uh, in, in the Navy. Uh, so right after that I went on to college and I started studying the uh, ecology and relationships to science and psychology and furthering into experimental psychology and, and uh, engineering which would then help me to apply the electric car, the uh, computer driven relationship to computers moving toward robotics and then from robotics moving toward uh, autonomous driving vehicles. Uh, and making it safer for flying and making it safer for driving, making it safer in every way rather than just us uh, pushing a pedal and stopping a car and doing the things that we normally do in a mechanical world. Uh, my job was to help bring an intuitive uh, technology that would come in to assist 
the process of our regular life. You know, whether it be a person who's repetitively working in industry and doing something in a repetitive way, it was my job to help change that and turn that over to robotics and turn that over to te technology and allow people who are being used for labor, you know, just labor itself, just mind-bending labor, and uh, give them the freedom to go back to school and learn skills and learn uh, technical abilities and engineering and science. And uh, slowly but surely, we would then go from uneducated humanity who are working in the fields of, of coal and uh, farming and other areas where it really doesn't require a lot of education. Uh, and it's just us in labor uh, maintaining uh, uh, the labor field, the, the workforce. Yeah, so it was my job was to uh, raise that up and also raise up the consciousness in society um, from the 60s and the 70s by introducing rock and roll, music that isn't what you know as rock and roll, the process of Elvis Presley, but more along the line of the process of the hippie movement where we came and sang songs of love and future and uh, how we can live together in harmony and do the things that we need to do w in a really balanced, beautiful way with really right use of music and right use of lyrics and right use of uh, instruments. So all these people were like masterful at what they did. They wrote because they were uh, uh, influenced by the soul. So it was very soulfully integrated uh, group of people that uh, worked with me in my, my, my work. You know, they were the ones who ended the war in Vietnam. They were the ones who kicked out the president. They were the ones who eliminated the, uh, many of the processes against black people and women and human rights. So we, we fostered all the things that you hear about uh, that were in those periods of time. That was my group. Those were my group activities. So every 10 years, I was deeply involved in an activity whether it be ending the war of Vietnam or changing the process of the women's movement and, and human rights and, and animal rights. So I literally lived that out for a long time, studying in psychology, anthropology, sociology, and helping to fine tune really what would be the natural lifestyle for humanity to uh, cooperate in all the kingdoms and allow each kingdom the freedom that it would need in order to attain a soul, not just human beings, but every single kingdom. That was my, uh, that's my work. Yeah, so from 1960s, 70s, and 80s, uh, I was moved to do all of that. And by the time I got to the year 2000, I was involved in the process of eliminating these grays that you hear about, walk-ins and grays and the extraterrestrials and the people who were channeling Ramtha and all those demons and, and uh, out-of-body spirits. All of that was happening uh, during the 80s, 90s, and up to the year 2000. So I entered right into that, met with most of the people who do that, uh, walked in as an alternative teacher. Uh, teacher who does not teach any of that and explains why all of that is dangerous and what are the real rules behind psychic development and what is real true psychicism and what are the different pitfalls of different types of divination or psychicism that people are involved in. Just where could dangers lie? Where, what dangers would we be in? Are we actually opening a door to where we can allow ourselves to be possessed? And are we opening doors to where we can allow society to fall? completely, you know, without even knowing that we're doing such things. And that was my work for about 20 years. I was closing those doors and going and finding where the doors were open and closing the doors and finding the demons of people incarnated, like Hitler and others, who do reincarnate. I had to locate them, get to know exactly who they are, and then close them down. You know, and get the, through, before they died, I had to go through the process of helping them go through the healing crisis of uh, being recognized by the Lord and uh, closing down their pedophilia. Because most every single one of these uh, demons who were lunar lords and uh, reincarnations of Hitler and Mussolini and others are all pedophiles. They're all people who take advantage of little children. And they rape them, they molest them, they seduce them, they do this whole entire thing. And then our entire social system is uh, bled off on that lunar quality that these people get away with. 
and it bleeds into our, our system. And we don't really know that uh, our tolerance of what we're dealing with in such a big degree is really a process of uh, the Antichrist and the work of the Antichrist externalized in the world in many different levels, but mainly through pedophilia and different perversions, sex magic and money magic. So I, I focused on taking care of that, you know, and I had to find out every single person who they were and what they were doing and locate that process. And by the year 2000, I had achieved uh, uh, touching most of the biggest demons on the planet, literally walking up to them, either grabbing their foot or shaking their hands and uh, or talking to them on the phone and uh, actually uh, having a relationship between Jesus Christ and that person. Yeah, so that ended their relationship of ruling Earth. Yeah, I, I ended the door that they got through, and now they're going back to where they come from. Yeah, and there's no doubt in my mind that's exactly what's happening. So you're saved under those relationships. And, and by the year 2000, I closed thousands of doors, and both uh, terrestrially and extraterrestrially. So by the year 2000, I was ready to uh, be enthroned, which I was enthroned as the incarnation of Buddha and in Tibet and in India and in Nepal. And once that was done, which, which I only allowed five years for that to happen in, uh, wow, five-year cycle, that's it. That's all for myself. You know, and then after that, it, it is what it is. You know, I am already enthroned. I don't need to be enthroned a million times. I don't need to be recognized a million times. Uh, once the masters have recognized me and they know me in this life, that's all I have to do. Now I'm free to go do a whole bunch of other things. So in year 2005, I began the process of healing the nations. You know, I established the reality of new sciences for the betterment of humanity. And the sciences would be the ones that I established back in the early 70s, 80s, and 90s. And those would be the electric car, solar, and many different alternative technologies that would take us out of the life that we're in. A lot of um, labor and, and a lack of financial security in people's lives. And so I began a process of, of uh, changing that entire thing by the year 2050, we will be in another world. We'll be in the world that I created, not the world Satan created. And we'll be in a world in which every single living human being will be fed every day, and every single living human being will have a place to sleep every day, and every single living human being will be in right relationship to another human being that will help them throughout their life when they have a need. Yeah, we will not be left alone for any reason yeah, uh, due to the reality of the Christ consciousness and the soul. You know, so that takes a lot of work. There's a lot of effort going into that. So by the year uh, 2000 came along, I had engineered uh, the working out of a plan of how the electric car can be furthered and built and established. So I actually uh, established my own electric car company by the year 2005. I also established a church, one of the monastery, a building, this particular monastery here. I established that in 2005, both that and the electric car, which nowadays you're all thinking, wow, electric car, that's really quite an advancement. Someone did that. Elon Musk, what a guy, you know. But in reality, it wasn't Elon Musk. It was behind the scene. It was the process of the new group of world servers and that there was a whole bunch of people that were working to support the coming of all of this in the new world of Christ, in the new world of humanity, in a humane world. Yeah. So by the year 2005, I had established the electric car, how it'll work, and I began working directly in uh, helping to finance and support uh, Elon Musk and that electric car. But I'd also lived and worked out the process of the space program prior to that, when I was only 10, 11, 12, 13. By the time I was 18 years old, I had put man on the moon. Yeah, I did that, yeah, and I established the relationship of which type of rockets we needed to use to get us to that point uh, at the level of type of uh, capsules. You know, we went through the mercury capsule. We went through all these different. I was involved in every single one of them. I weighed them out. I set the trajectory. I wrote them letters on a monthly basis, even though I was only 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12 years old. You know, so uh, my activities have been uh, intense. 
Yeah, and and um, there's b never been a check. There's never been a support system. There's never been any recognition of my designs of cars, my designs of the solar electric uh, process of uh, PVC and all the things that we've got going on are all things that I've put a lot of time into and then I would then overshadow and bless hundreds of people simultaneously. And instead of one person coming up with that design, hundreds of people would come up with the design simultaneously. And this began happening in the late 19, or the late 1800s to the early 1900s, like Tesla and Ford and all those people, they were all part of the new group of world servers that were just starting to establish this telepathic energy, closing the door of the astral plane and opening the door of telepathy and the etheric plane and the science that will actually give us the understanding of the etheric plane and the mind of God literally the mind of God. We can resonate with the mind of God. When we do that, we, we raise ourselves up into spontaneous meditation and spontaneous transmission to our higher self. And we have no idea what that means, you know, where, where that leads us and what kind of consciousness that leads us. But it's an involvement in, uh, in the ability to live a life that is, requires a lot less materialism a whole lot more of uh, recognition and appreciation of what is in your world and what's going on. And the, in order to get to that, we have to pass through a place called revelation. And that's what I provide. I provide revelation. Yeah, it's not something anybody's going to give you. It's not something you're going to read in a book. Uh, you know, nothing like that's going to happen. No religion's going to be based on getting you revelation. But I'm going to give you revelation, you know, because I work out the trouble it takes to go through the illusions and the delusions and all the confusions of the misunderstandings and misrepresentation that's been going on and still re is represented, even in our government, uh, represented in science, represented in everything. There is a lower mind perspective to everything. So I focus my attention on everything and I allow myself spontaneously to relate. And once I relate to any given thing, it is raised up. It now has a relationship with me, where before that time, it didn't have a relationship with me. But as I do that, I'm literally changing what is veiled into what is reveiled, revealed. Yeah, so I'm raising a, a ray, a consciousness ray, a revelation up into the brow in every living human being. And I'm releasing the influence of people not having the Holy Spirit in their consciousness and allowing them to have a right relationship to everything in life where they do care yeah, and they do share and they do respond. And this happens spontaneously. It's only if the door is open and you're flooded with this astral confusion that changes your chakras. And you can't change these chakras. You know, it, ha it takes, requires masters. It requires the highest of the highs and the holiest of the holies to, to gather your uh, spiritual energy and hold it into a very strong, consistent pattern. Yeah, and that's where the influence comes from in, by this work, working through 2000, 2005, uh, that influence changes everything. If you can imagine, when I started in 2005, first I had an enthronement, and it's where Tibet enthrones me in all of these distant monasteries, and all of these masters start receiving their tools, and they start receiving transmission directly from the Buddha that they've been studying with for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years, yeah, and this particular uh, Buddha here, the statue that you see here is really big, but this is of Buddha Maitreya, yeah? This is the next incarnation of Buddha, Buddha Maitreya. And that little bitty person down there in the bottom, that's Buddha Maitreya, that's me, yeah? And I'm representing, you know, you see all these statues and then these pictures behind me. These are the highest living masters on earth in body today, yeah? And they're sitting right behind me. And their pujas, their meditations and everything is what brought me into a physical incarnation so that I can consistently do the work that I needed to do by the time I was 40 years old. Is my, they came for me at nine years old. They're here now still doing this. And all of that influences me holding this door closed. Yeah? 
It's not just me. It's a whole bunch of highly enlightened beings. Yeah? Just like this guy here. This is the head of Swamis of India and all of Nepal. The closest friend to the Karmapa, a Shivite. Yeah? One of the highest living people in all of Nepal. Yeah? And he and I, you know, hung out because he saw me as the reincarnation of Maitreya, the incarnation of Katama, you know, the incarnation of the process that comes in from Shiva or Vishnu or Brahma. All of those things, he was able to recognize those things. So shortly after that, I got in relationship to where they, they recognized me as Milarepa. So all within a short period of time, from the year 2000 to the year 2005, hundreds of my previous lives are coming back to me from these masters who are still alive and they're seeking me out. This man here is one who was the disciple to Milarepa and he's been holding this discipleship since the time of Milarepa. You know, so when Milarepa comes, he would be the one hands him a certificate and says, you have reincarnated, this is your monastery, and all of this is endowed back to you. Yeah. So this is be between 2000 and 2005. Now, what do I do with that energy? I'm just a guy from California. I'm a human being. People are looking at me like I'm just a human being. But I'm not. Behind the scene, you don't know that I'm the holiest person on the planet Earth. And I'm blessed that way. I'm not, I don't, uh, it's not that because I come with rings of holiness, you know, or some superficial magic suit like Superman, you know. I come because I am, uh, day by day, I'm anointed, yeah. I, ha I receive the anointing of all the masters of this planet. And they came for me, and they always do in every incarnation, you know. So I'm just sharing, you know, with you, you know, the process that you're, your 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 guy who comes from America and looks similar to yourself, you know. But you show me someone who's gone through any of this, even one of these things, yeah. You know, one enthronement would be a hot one. That would be really something, you know. Even get yourself into Buddhism and become a monk and a nun and go through the college of sixteen years and come out as a real authorized nun and a monk. Yeah, go through that shit. I don't require you to do that. Yeah, because if you come to me, I overshadow you. Yeah, and you can get all those processes that you need to get. Yeah, but the process these people carry out is because of their previous life initiations. So they're forced to go right back to the same monastery, pick up the same books, and hold the transmission so it doesn't get misinterpreted. It's only done by them holding the transmission of saying the words and keeping it straight, yeah? So from 2000 to 2005, I receive all this stuff and I get all this and, and it's empowering this planet, yeah? And I build this on the planet, yeah? I build this pyramid here on the planet. Yeah, and I create all those domes, and I put pyramids over those domes, and I create a science that allows what is on an etheric level, unseen, just there, happens to be there, there's an earth, there's a moon, it's connected mathematically, you can't see it, yeah, but it's there, yeah, and it's there, and it's looking like this. Now, in a master's mind, he could see that, he could see the etheric field, no matter how big it is. A master could see it and feel it and is driven by it because it's temple. A master is a part of the temple, yeah? So the master is going to see the greater temple all the way to God because God controls the whole freaking universe. This planet's nothing and you're trying to figure out God on a planet level is not going to happen, you know? But the way I'm doing it, it'll happen through transmission and the Holy Spirit. Yeah? You know, so... This planetary heavenly thing that you can't see, you can't see the, the etheric reality of the pyramid and the earth and all of that, yeah? So I can make these tools, yeah? And I can make these geometric forms. And they all are part of applied geomancy that's locked into the etheric field that you can't see. So even if I do make it, 
make these geometric forms, the closest you can get to it is calling it the the physical form that it is. Oh, that's a tetrahedron. Oh, that's a dodecahedron. Oh, that's whatever, you know. Oh, that's a circle. Uh, or a ball. Is that a ball? <laughs> you know, we can't get outside the astral plane. There's nothing divine in our mind. Yeah? We don't reflect anything divine. Even though it's right in front of you, you can't see it. So I named them. Yeah? I named them. I, I say like, Earth, 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 you know. And then, you know, geometrically, you know, now you can start to get a feel for what is happening on the other side of the etheric plane, which is in your mind, and it's connected to revelation and the Holy Spirit, but you literally have to close the door to your lies and your own personal deception, because that's the door, yeah? And when you close those, then all of a sudden, all these holy things I put in front of you, you lose all those unholy things inside of you, and now the holy things, which start from an atomic level, start making sense. And words start coming with them. Yeah? And if you say pyramid, you know, it's more than just a pyramid. Yeah? You're, you're thinking in terms of, you know, the holy divine sanctuary of the holiest of holies. Earth. Yeah? That this, this is, I call this Earth. Yeah? And that circle kind of looks like Earth. Yeah? But if you put this geometry together and apply that same geometry together, you get a 51 degree pyramid. You know? Applied out of that. But it's hidden. It's not something that shows itself right then and there. Yeah? So it's in even a higher state of mind that you have to continue going. And those are initiations. And people have no idea. None of this exists because you've been given religion, dogma. Yeah, you've been given dogma. You know, the, a, a pagan delusion of what things are, rather than the truth, which would be a whole lot easier for you if you were told the truth. Yeah, you know. So from 1995 uh, on through up to the year 2000. I worked toward uh, healing Tibetan Buddhism, and the, and and yet everybody's going, oh, Dalai Lama, this is the holiest place on earth. You know, all these people are so holy. Uh, you know, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. You never know. Yeah. So I walk into it, and guess what? You know, I find out the truth. And to do that, you know, I have to deal with. Now I have to heal all these people of Tibet, all of them. I have to heal all the people of Tibet. Because I'm their leader. I'm the, I'm the guy who heals. Yeah? You know, so my decision is, and I'm asked by the, the political party of Tibet, the government of Tibet, to build a stupa. Yeah? So they give me this piece of land, and it's located in Dharamsala, and it's located right behind the residence of the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama is the one who's supposed to have done this. Yeah? He's the head, right? But instead they come to me. Yeah, I build a residence, I put it there, I said, I am His Holiness Buddha Maitreya and all that, and, and I'm a tuku already, I've been enthroned all over the place, so everything is correct, except the Dalai Lama doesn't want anything to do with me, which is a weird thing, you know? But still, the government comes knocking on my door, asking me to build this stupa. So simultaneously, this is the, about the year 2005, 2003 to 2005, yeah? And I'm, and I'm restoring Tibetan Buddhism by overthrowing a demon. And no one knows this demon even exists. You know? So for me to do it, I have to take responsibility of healing and being responsible for being the personal, the only person who builds this stupa. Yeah? So every brick, even the location of the land, is all done by me. It's all paid for by me. So that there's no astral influence going in on the land, no political agenda going in on the land, you know, nothing like that. Just build this stupa and build it perfectly, yeah. So we go through the process of build the stupa, and simultaneously, we're building this. You know, we're building this here, and I'm building a stupa over in Dharamsala. 
So this, if you look at it, a pyramid, a structure as this, is a stupa. Yeah. So I'm literally building a whole bunch of stupas in order to save the same problem that happened in Tibet, the curse of America. The whole freaking curse of America. Because I'm, I'm out healing the nations right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm simultaneously, I'm healing the East and the West. Yeah. All evil, that channeling, and the, the, you know, everything that you can imagine here on, on this side is going on. And everything that you can imagine that, that had happened in Tibet that give a reason for them to be kicked out of Tibet. You know, all that was going on. You know, so here I heal. I heal Tibetan people. And I bring them to a holy site. I bring them to Glastonbury. Of all places. Let me show you. But Glastonbury is a central spot. It's a spot of one of the first churches of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I established that that relationship in order to bring about a right relationship to humanity, the balance between East and West. That was, that's me. Yeah, I'm the guy that balances this, having you got a left hemisphere, you got a right hemisphere, you're a male, you're a female, all this separation, you know, between the United States and one state, Louisiana, and the other state, California, or one country, you know, and another country. It's all in a state of separation. It's all a state of the astral plane. You know, so there's, there's a way to fix this. Yeah, and that's, that's what I do. Yeah, so in the process of uh, all this going on, I set up for these guys who are my, this is, in Tibetan Buddhism, I have this certificate that says that I'm a tuku from Lumbum Kamsen. And Lumbum Kamsen is the, the number one Kamsen of all the Drepung. And they, uh, through me, they went to England, and I have a church in, in Glastonbury, and I sent them to Glastonbury. And these are the highest of the highs in in uh, in all of Tibet, and these are the young Geshe's and Rinpoche's who just graduated their university, and then they meet me, and you know now we're going to go out and heal the world. So we're at world peace. We're doing a world peace tour, yeah, and the world doesn't want it. Yeah, England says, no, you're not going any further than this place. The witches surround us like mad. You can't imagine. The witches surrounded us like, a, a, in every single way. I even lost monks. They, they went off marrying witches. It was just a horrifying experience. But it was, it was really what was to happen. Yeah? And you know, we did everything we could. Uh, you know, I even brought uh, Prince Charles in and uh, gave him a Vajra. Yeah, here's his... Here's his little Vajra here. Yeah, Prince Charles receiving his Vajra and everybody meeting these really holy high lamas and they do a, a ceremony, uh, sand painting the mandala, you know, for healing the planet. They do it right there in England, you know. And England won't allow them out of England. They, they can't go to Paris. They can't go to Germany. They can't go to France. They won't be, the only place they're allowed is there and back to India. That's it, you know. So we're kind of stuck in this process. And so I am at the same time, I'm working on uh, healing the world. So I finish up this. Yeah, I continue building and build and build and build. And by the year 2010, 2012, I've completed this project. I have uh, pyramids on top of every single pyramid, and I have uh, orbs sitting on top. I have capstones sitting on top. I have speakers inside. I have this thing activated to 100%. Yeah, Everything that I'm supposed to do is now in an activated state. I've did my pujas. I've got them playing. I've got everything going on. And what that does is that that closes doors 
Every day is a different door. Yeah? Every day. Because it's all done through paganism. Yeah? The door of Monday. The door of Tuesday. Door of Wednesday. And then we go into July. And then we go into August. And we keep doing that. On a pagan day, every day, we go into another pagan day. And then we go into All Presidents Day. And then we go into all these different pagan associated realities that keeps us from our truth. There gives us obligations. Oh, here comes Christmas. Oh boy, here comes New Year's Eve. Here comes, you know, whatever. And it's just taking us from one obligation to the next, which is financially destroying us. Yeah? But on the other side, all these fat cats are going, well, it may be destroying you, but it's making me rich. We would lose our entire economy if you didn't follow through with these things like Christmas and Easter and all these little things you do for Valentine's Day and, you know, all these things you do, yeah, and having to go to the football game and having to go to the baseball game. All these things are part of uh, the influence of not having spirituality in your life. You've been given all this religion, but it never had a day, never had an ounce, never had a moment of spirituality in it. None of them were disciples of mine. All my disciples I personally select. Yeah? And it's very hard to become a disciple. I am in all the lineages of Tibetan Buddhism, but you take each lineage, and in every lineage you, you can have tens of thousands of students, but there's only a handful, maybe 12 or 11, out of each lineage that has carried on a relationship to me and holds that in their energy and is able to, the, in these days, stand up and say, oh, that's my teacher, and this is where I'm at, and now I'm beginning to remember and getting some clarity and not have to be ruled by false teachers because they don't know they're a teacher and what position they hold as a teacher. Yeah, Because with false Dalai Lamas and popes and people like that, all the effort you put into this is lost. Yeah, Lost. There's n not a spiritual ground you can lay on. None. Yeah, You got Oprah. Yeah, yeah. She's going to take you just so far and she's going to take you to hell. Yeah, And yet there's everything in you going, oh, but I trust in God. No, you don't. You trust in Oprah. Yeah, If you trusted in God, you would read and it would say, watch out. Oprah's a pagan witch. And she's leading you to universal belief systems through paganism and the great mother goddess. Yeah, And you could say the same, you know, for the religious relationship to the Catholic Church. You, know, you can believe all you want, but if you look at it and listen to it, you'll find out you're in a pagan relationship, and they actually make a direct relationship to Lucifer. And they give you a pagan church of a mother goddess. And that's who you pray to. That's who you gain all your relationships to ever becoming a saint. You have to pass through this delusion that is set up by Lucifer. Yeah, if you just look into it. Because in this world, lies really don't happen. They're half lies. So in, in the Catholic Church, they're going to do it in, in, uh, in a language you don't understand. Yeah? They'll do Latin and om plus, um, plus uh, brebos or whatever, you know. Uh, and then, but they have to say the word Lucifer because that's in Latin. You know, so you listen to their pujas, you know, and you go, what was that about Lucifer? What? I wonder what that was. Oh, they're probably saying, no, 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 Lucifer, stay away. And, you know, that's where your head will go rather than the truth. Yeah. You know, so there isn't hardly a thing, whether it be Muslims or the Jewish relationship or any relationship of religion. It, it holds you in that brow center rather than in your religious center, which would be your solar plex. So your solar plex is obligated to this pagan belief system. And the pagan belief system is something that has to do with veiling God. It's telling you this is what's going on, but it's not true. It's telling you Jesus is the son of God, but they won't tell you that they believe God is Lucifer. Yeah, And yet if you study the Catholic Church, that's exactly what you're going to find. Yeah. You know, so it's it's all of these things I have to do 
in order to bring about a change by the year 2050. Yeah, and it's a long way between now and 2050. Yeah, there's an enormous. I mean, we still have Trump, and we can have it another six months, maybe another two years. It's a long way to the year 2050. Yeah, it's a long way. Yeah, it's a long way until, till uh, Elon Musk becomes a spiritual man. Yeah, we've already got that in several of the people. Yeah. But if you're high in economy and high in money, you may move to philanthropy, but you can't quite hold a right relationship to God. But you can still do philanthropy because you're almost, almost at a caring, sharing level to where you can almost be revealed the reality that God exists. And that there isn't anything you're going to get done in life that isn't without the blessing of God. Yeah. And all of it is just, uh, you know, an, uh, an illustrated reality of your intellectuality, given justification behind things, yeah? But it doesn't make any real, real truth to it, yeah? You know, so all of this, imagine working this from the year 2005, and now we're at uh, um, 2019 going into 2000, or 2020 going into 2021, yeah? So we have a lot of Earth, Earth changes, yeah, nature qualities, healing crises that are going to move through humanity. Yeah, because when the soul is awakened, it awakens and changes dark uh, genetic material, yeah, circumstances and, and situations that that don't seem to uh, come up. You know, it seems like we just kind of get away with it. Yeah, but in the process of the quickening of the soul. Uh, things happen a lot faster, and they happen through a healing crisis, and they happen through, you know, the possibility of, of a big earthquake or a possibility of things that you don't expect, you know, things that, you know, having a, a flood simultaneously while you have the coronavirus and, you know, all these different things are coming down, and and then all of a sudden we're in a, in a nation to where a, um, a revolt of violence can happen out of a one event like today. You know, we've got a group of people all around the world, not just in a state or in a town where an event takes place. But people, due to the kind of political environment we've got with hate, you know, telling people, go beat that person up. They're just a bunch of thugs. Let's get the military in there. We're going to shoot them. That's our outcome. We're just going to bring the military and we'll shoot them. Yeah. Well, th these are... What he's doing, he's bringing in the very people who's causing the problem, yeah? And he's just going to bring in more of the same thing. The people who are doing the, the rioting and stuff, if you talk to them, they won't tell you that that's what they're doing. They'll tell you that they're there for a totally different thing. And how and why all this is happening, they're never going to talk about how and why they're doing it. Not that they spent a year and a half in training on, on making sure that they grab all the trash cans and that they have uh, a ways of starting fires and that they have to do these in very logical ways to close off blocks so that you can stop the fire departments from coming in. And that way you also cause the news media to come right to you because it's a safe area you know, for news media to stand. So they created, they worked this all out, spending a year or so in rooms, you know, coming up with ideas. Okay, now here's what we're going to do. A team. <laughs> we're all coming, 900 of us. You know, we should be in that state, whatever state it happens, we should be in that state within 48 hours. We just get in our cars, no one knows we're coming. Come from all sides, you know. Fill our gas tanks up, get our bottles filled up, put our little Molotov cocktails together, you know, and we will start a violent attack. As though people in town are really pissed off. Yeah. But it's, it's no one from town that's doing it. Just a few people. But it's all coming in from outside in a terrorist group that is f sponsored by America. Yeah, by people who believe in, you know, we should have not had the Civil War turn out the way it did. Yeah, like Trump. He honestly believes the other side should have won. Yeah. 
And that's what he's bringing in to revolution, is the other side to externalize itself and make sure that the laws that come from justice and caring and right reality that comes from little blue coats gets annihilated. Yeah? And we got to bring in the gray coats yeah, to make things right. Yeah. I mean, he would tear everything down. Every president that we've had, you know, if this guy stays in office, he is going to open as many doors as he possibly can to take away all the virtues that have been established, you know, for our right use of work. Yeah. So there's a lot that can come about by a healing crisis. Yeah. So by me establishing from the year 2005 to, to now, the year 2020, and working with uh, setting up these healing tools and setting up the music and everything, the last arrangements that, that comes from this work is the timing of the schedule of the sun. You know, here we are in the year 2020. Yeah, this is, we are in a solar uh, connection. Yeah, we're on a planetary, this is a planetary thing, but our planet is driven by solar principles. Yeah, and the solar principles is like this pyramid with the, uh, you know, the earth and everything. It's set. It's a time. And Christ is the center of time. Yeah, the Lord of time. Yeah, so it's all about time that's healing us. It's the influence of time that's bringing this all change about. Yeah. So my work is to make sure, and, and I'm not like in a logical thing, I've got to do this at this time and this finish by this time, yeah? But in everything that I do, it has an effect on the future event of things that are going to be worked on later, yeah? And they're easier to work on after a period of time, yeah? So the initial process of stopping the war in Vietnam and ending nuclear attack on the United States and then stopping the war of Vietnam and then, you know, the next stage stopping a president from being a corrupt and letting people think that corruption is legal and it's okay to do these things, you know, stopping those things and, and then moving toward, you know, masses of people moving toward love and peace and then coming out with solar panels and houses that are much easier to live in and social systems between people that aren't separate but more uh, group wise you know where we can live as a as a group we can live with neighbors we can live with more people in a house than we would normally because we get along yeah we have right relationship together yeah that was established during a cycle of time and that cycle of time comes back around and that's where we're at the year 2020 is that cycle of time where those people most of all those people have died and most of those all those people have come back and most of all those people are between their 15 20s and 30s so they're playing major roles in the process between the year 2020 and the year 2050 they're the older people they're the ones who are making decisions. They're in charge. They run the businesses. They run the government. They run many different things. And the really dumb, you know, logistically ridiculous people, you know, that are holding back everything have died. Yeah. And all those people who had good ideas but couldn't get them done because there were a lot of people keeping them from happening are no longer around. And those people are now in their final days able to start pulling them off and then other people behind them who are following behind that in numbers and they're getting older as time comes on, they become a new wave of possibilities. Yeah? Where every single manufacturer is putting out electric cars. Every single manufacturer, whether it be an airplane or a car, you know, we're in a movement between the year 2030 and the year 2040. We're going to move so fast. Right now we're going, oh, electric cars, wow, that means we've got to get rid of our fossil fuel motor and move to an electric motor. Oh, wow, what's that going to be like? Don't get stuck to it, yeah, because in 10 years that's going to be gone. You're not going to have that. It's going to be a totally different thing. We're going to be electric pulse, we're going to get rid of tires, and we're going to start flying, yeah? And don't worry, you do not have to learn how to fly, yeah? Yeah, and it's just because we're stuck in thinking we had to get a license, we had to learn how to ride a bike, we had to learn how to drive a car, 
Oh, if I ever want to fly, oh, that's scary because I'm surely going to crash. Just like I do in a car, just like I do on a bike. Yeah, all these things are very hazardous to our life. Yeah, so everything that's being worked out, that all the new group of world servers is there because they share and they care. And they bring in new technologies that see things that would stop, literally, see the event of a horrifying millions of people dying over the next hundred years. And yet these people come in with ideas that literally fosters those things not happening. Hospitals start closing down. Insurance companies don't exist. You know, all these things that are fostered and fulfilled you know, under the process of accidents. Yeah, and all these bad kind of job circumstances and pollutant circumstances, food, things that go in our food, the crap that's in the can, all the stuff that we're getting in this that's killing us. And we have no idea that this is what's going on. So over the next 20 years, laws will change toward humanity. Yeah, and we're not going to be forced to not eat sugar. We're going to be forcing the companies to stop producing products of sugar simply because we won't buy them anymore. So they have to change that process. And then it all comes down to the fact we make our own food at home. We don't find processed food anymore. Yeah, We don't go to Burger King anymore. We don't go to a restaurant anymore. Yeah, We enjoy being home and cooking. And the joy that you get for cooking for another person or receiving food from another person that you love and you care about is a billion times better than going to a restaurant and eating food. You're missing everything, yeah? And that's the door that is opened. That's the astral plane. That loving relationship that you, you get these hormones that come with being with other people with making love with other people, coming in contact with other people, receiving love from other people, giving love to other people, has a chemical process inside of us. And that's what gives us longevity. That's what gives us spirituality. That's what gives us certain states of consciousness that elevates our ability to think in certain ways because we have hormones in us that are missing right now. Yeah, And once they come back into our system, yeah, then we have fewer needs. We don't have the design or desire to alcohol. We don't have design or desire to sugar. Yeah. And we're able to absorb the fat that's on our body. Yeah. Because we've lived a lifestyle you know, that changes from people who are just eating carbohydrates and storing it to a person who's burned off almost all their carbohydrates because they just don't really put any in their body. Yeah, you've got to really re take a lot of refined food or a lot of fruit and put it in your body to get carbohydrates into you. Really, it is not an easy source to get carbohydrates from unless you get refined food. Yeah. So over the next 20 years, that's going to be the consciousness inside of humanity is learning that processed food of any kind is, is something that we, we do not feel close to. Just like sugar, we don't feel close to it. Alcohol, mm, nope, nope, not even wine, nope, nope. Not even holy wine, nope, nope, no, nothing, nope, no thanks. No, no, vinegar maybe, but, you know, not wine, yeah. Vinegar's healthy, hey, I'll, I'll have a sip, yeah. You know, so there's all these things that of discernment and discrimination and attractiveness, things that we discern, discriminate, creates our ability to respond. And it's in the ability to respond that the Holy Spirit is in the body and it's ex expressing. And once it begins to express, we have the ability to live by the laws of nature. Yeah, we don't go against them. We live by them. And then we start benefiting from the laws of nature in the tree of life. And we have no idea what that means. But, you know, living a very long time and being extremely blessed is like saying I'm the luckiest person on earth. I've never had a broken bone. I've never had an accident. I've never been sick. Everything I've ever wanted, I've always gotten. Everything I've ever wanted in another person, it's always happened. You know, it's like I've got, you know, lucky charms all around me. 
Yeah. But now you lose all those defining ways of looking at things from a pagan world. And now you can see them, you know, as product of aspiration. Yeah, that you can feel from your own aspiration you've blessed another person. And you can literally sense the power of blessing. You could sense the power of changing another person by holding your consciousness in a certain way. Yeah, and we, we move that way. And from the year 2030 to the year 2050, those become the things that we want to do. Now, like if we want to do uh, meditation, uh, people go, let's do mindfulness. Yeah, because we have no idea how to do meditation. So let's try mindfulness, which means that you're just going to try and become aware of what's on your mind and let it go. Relax it, you know, let it go. Yeah. Oh, that's a great thing, but that's not meditation. It's a nice thing, but it's not meditation. Yeah. It's a part of it, but it's not meditation. Yeah. Real meditation is transmission. Yeah. That's why everybody who receives my meditations and they, you know, from the masters to anybody, anybody who receives my meditations, the very first thing they say is that I have tried to meditate before. I have tried a lot. And I, I, I cannot actually sit and meditate. I can't even imagine sitting to meditate. You know, uh, all the things I would have to stop doing, thinking, and all those things. You know, I just have not been able to do that yet. But yet. When I put your meditation on and I just lay back, I am gone. I'm in a highest state of meditation I could ever imagine to be in minutes. And I don't come out of it. Yeah? My mind doesn't get all weird, you know, and all these things don't normally, you know, that would come up, don't come up. You know, and I don't care if you're in India, I don't care if you're in Nepal, I don't care if you're a taxi driver, I don't care what lifestyle you have. If you go in and do soul therapy, you have this experience that you are a master meditator. Yeah? And you cannot attain mastery in meditation without a master. That's how you get there. It's not a self thing. Yeah? You're not here to learn how to meditate. You're here to meditate with a master. And it's from that, you, you change your meditating or hanging out with idiots to hanging out with a master and getting the benefit of hanging out with a master rather than hanging out with an idiot. And you could be the only idiot you're hanging out with, you know? But you're not hanging out with a master. It's a big diff. Big diff, yeah? So that's the difference between now and the year 2050. The year 2050, and imagine here, I'm, I'm 69 years old, and I'm talking about this shit, you know, and the likelihood is that I would croak, you know, somewhere between now and the year 2030. Then I'd reincarnate around the year 2032, 33. I'd be walking around, uh, be figured out by the year 2040. Yeah, and then by the year 2050, I'm back to 18, 20 years old, and I'm just the same, exactly same as I am right now. You know, so in my world, there's not a leap of difference in incarnation to reincarnation and continuing this thing on. So I know that in the year 2050, this will continue. Because whether I die or not, whether I'm 130 years old in the year 2050, which I really don't want to look forward to that, yeah, but if I am, you know, ye, <laughs> that'll be something, yeah? But it'll all mean that we're going to get to a place to where we're able to witness Jesus Christ, yeah? We're able to literally see Jesus Christ, hear the words of Jesus Christ, and know that we're in the world with Jesus Christ, you know? That's the time. 2050 is the time when your mundaneness kind of is evaporated considerably, and you you witness Jesus Christ often enough between the year 2020 and the year 2050, which it may only happen once or twice in a year. Yeah? But it adds up. By the time you get to the year 2050, I can walk around and an enormous number of people will know who I am. Yeah? And it won't be like, oh my God, join the church or something like that. But it'll be an actual revelation that they've had that's ongoing and they know me as a singular entity that is Jesus Christ. 
Yeah, and that's the one they have as their master, as the one that talks to them when they have a problem, as the one that talks to their little kid when it has a problem, as the one who talked to grandpa when he had a problem. You know, there's only one guy who is the master for everybody. And by the year 2050, everybody will come in contact with that friend, relative, cousin, aunt, uncle. They'll all have had that relationship. So then as I walk around, you know, little kids are able to make these comments very quickly and want to sit on my lap and want to be in my life at a very strong level from the year 2050 on. Yeah. You know, so and and you know everybody dies and comes back, so everybody comes back in that that original state from the year 2050 on, where the children are they cannot but see Jesus, yeah, and they don't want to go someplace else and leave Jesus, you know they want to still hang out with Jesus because he's he's got things to say he's cool, yeah, and kids are like that they know that I'm a very spontaneous dude. You know, and I'm a lot of fun to hang out with. Yeah. You know, so that's going to be the process inside of humanity. The planetary logos will become the energy of the planet for the planetary logos rather than Lucifer. And the door will close. Yeah. And your process of not being able to witness, but only witness all this bullshit that you can't control. You can't control Trump. You can't control you know, Michael Jackson reincarnating and coming out and doing what he's doing, no one realizing what's going on, yeah? But if I take it all away, then you're free. Yeah, all right, so let's meditate. And don't forget, reincarnation who are working to make America great. <laughs>
my physical and etheric body. So there is a normal flow of energy in my physical and etheric body. Through this day and every day, I ask this in the name of the Christ to serve the one. All in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this invocation that we're going to do is the invocation of the seven rays, the alignment of the seven rays, the seven rays of God. So it, it's a puja that I developed for healing the nations, and I formulated the seven rays. This took a long time, thousands and thousands and thousands of years uh, for me to... Um, uh, the story goes that I spent my time uh, as an incarnation of Shiva, which is tens of thousands of years ago. And during that time, uh, I was the only living yogi on the planet, the only spiritual being that existed on the planet. And I never moved. I sat in a, in a uh, transcendent state. I was in constant state of meditation. I never opened my eyes. Yeah, and, and yet I was alive. And when I did and I got up, I, uh, in, I was in such a state of bliss that I would dance and sing and have crazy experiences that made people extremely uh, uh, feel threatened by me. Like, what kind of crazy behavior is that? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I didn't make any friends and, and no one really knew what was m my purpose. Yeah. And so a long time passed and uh, I, an age of where we're at now, uh, at around uh, 5,000 years ago, uh, at that time it was an age where humanity was able to take spiritual direction. And, and uh, to do that they needed uh, the influences of the seven rays. And I needed, and I was the only one who carried those seven rays. That was my consciousness. And, and uh, so it was my job to transmit those seven rays to seven human beings. And so uh, I meditated for a long period of time. And that drew seven of the highest rishis uh, to me. And uh, this is all in, in history. You can read this. Yeah, it's not something I'm telling you that's a nice story. It's a real story, and it's the story of Shiva. Yeah, so when Shiva took his first disciples, and so I sat and meditated for a long time, I knew that I had a new responsibility where I had to become a teacher yeah, and uh, give the practice of, of uh, yogi, of a yogi. And so doing that, I took the seven rishis and had them sit with me, and each one took on a different ray. Yeah, which I was masterful in. Yeah, first ray, second ray, third ray, all seven rays. And each one I would transmit that ray to this individual. And they it turned to become the soul of this person. And all the soulful qualities that I uh, that come with this transmission began manifesting into this person and that's how they became a master. They became a master of that ray. So I had seven masters of the seven rays, and each one I was able to communicate with because I was the master of all seven rays, master of masters, but for each one I was their individual master. You know, this one being the fourth ray and this one being the third ray. You know, I would move right into the influence of that third ray, and I would express it in the clearest way that that being would receive because it was a perfect, like a tuning fork to their existence, because they were reborn. When I took them as a student, that is what happens. That when you become my student, you're reborn. You know, but no one knows this exists, because we all think that we're in this one family of you know, human kingdom, and we're all a bunch of apes. You know, so where I come from, we're not apes. <laughs> yeah. you know, so this, this process goes on, and 
uh, in the process of teaching them these seven rays and giving transmission to each one, it clarified my view of the rays and by creating the influence for them to, uh, to harness the singular ray of the second ray as a soul ray, but expressed as a singular ray, whether it be the first ray, second ray, or seventh ray. So that was difficult. That's, that was my yoga, was to uh, find a way to express that singular ray, but yet have it come as a second ray, so that that would become their real truth, would be love. Yeah? But it would, it, their, their revelation would be the awareness of the ray, the, of their soul. Yeah? And so in doing that, this raised up the kingdom of humanity into the kingdom of the soul. And it was just seven people. And I'm the monad, and I'm sitting there, and I'm teaching the soul to seven beings who are now radiating for the first time on earth the seven rays. And because they're human beings, they are the caretakers of this earth. So I made each one the regent of a continent. Yeah. So I established the seven rays on the seven continents, establishing each continent to have a soul ray and a personality ray, which was the ray of that master. Yeah. So I didn't send them to that location because I'm always at that location. So all I had to do was just do this to these people. Yeah. And that immediately affected the continents. So. Uh, that effect and all that that I just did, that I just taught you, is in this puja. Yeah, it's it's why I say the words that I say. Yeah, why I say, uh, England, you have these rays, the first ray and the second ray, and Germany, you have re these rays, the first ray and the uh, fourth ray and the first ray, and India, you have these rays. You know, and and then I invoke those rays to come together. Yeah, because my work is with these masters. And the masters are listening to my teaching 24-7. That's all they do. They're not figuring out how to do mechanical things. They are still my disciples. Yeah. So when I made these pujas, I made these pujas for the masters yeah, so that they could receive these pujas and we could begin the healing of the nations. So that's what this invocation is for. These are the seven rays of God and that they're... Uh, designed to do a very specific science and uh, invocation. So if you listen to them and understand what I just explained, you know, then you get an idea as to how this science works, you know, the, that it works by uh, the influence of the transmission of the soul and that these masters carry that transmission. So just uh, focus in on this little puja. I invoke 
the sense of touch and the first ray. Sixth ray 
as the vegetable kingdom. The third ray and the sixth ray as the animal kingdom. The fourth ray and the fifth ray as the human kingdom. The fifth ray and the second ray as the egoic soul. The sixth ray and the third ray as planetary lives. The first ray and the seventh ray as solar lives. Disperse the clouds. I invoke Brazil. 
zeal and its second ray personality to integrate its fourth ray soul to hide the sea. I invoke the entity of this planet, the planetary logos, to incarnate the life and the beingness of this planet. So there's a lot of people <coughs> who wear a cross and there's a lot of people who have pictures of me on the wall and there's a lot of people who, who get a lot from that. Yeah. And as time goes on, uh, the realization of seeing physically me walk around and the chance of me, you know, coming up to you and saying hello physically. Yeah. And the chance that I'm in this world and not in a heaven that you have to somehow make a way to, yeah? But I'm in this world so that you can make your way to heaven. That's what I said in the beginning. Through me, you make your way to heaven. Now, that doesn't mean I go sit in heaven and you got to make your way now to heaven to get to me. That makes no sense, yeah? It never was set that way. I was literally incarnated, standing there talking to everybody, explaining everything, but no one wanted to believe it. Everybody wanted to take me as a person. This is my brother, this is my cousin, that's my mom. You know, I had to do it in the town that I was grown, growing up in, you know, because I had to face my own dweller. I had to get past that. I had to get them past that, you know, so that they can... You know, when I keep reincarnating, this doesn't happen again, you know, and it did. It happened when this life, you know, and it happened in all my other lives. But it's definitely my biggest problem is the fact that, you know, the, the people that I come in with attach themselves to me and do not find a way to let go. Yeah. And 
that they need to let go in order for me to continue growing and be the person I'm meant to be because there's no interpretation, no no understanding as to what I'm supposed to be doing here, yeah, and how this is supposed to work out. So there's a lot in the transition of where we're coming from, you know, of all these religions and all this dogma to the actual physical presence of the Lord on earth, you know, which is, it's not a cult, it's not, you know, uh, you know, like in most cults, it's a one-time thing. The guy comes, says, hey, I'm Jesus Christ, dies, and you never see him again. <laughs> you know, it's like done and over with. But I'm I'm on the funny side of this thing. You know, I actually have masters who look for me. They find me when I'm a child, and they put me on a throne. And as you can see, this happens in Tibet. It will happen to me forever, forever, you know. So I, that's my last worry is that, you know. My only worry is the people that I reincarnate with. You know, how are they going to handle it? You know, I can't just, you know, this is not a place where karma is so clear I could just appear and never have to take a physical incarnation. For me to raise everybody up, I have to take a physical incarnation. You know, I have to do that. I have to take all the limitation and I have to raise it up. There's no way I can just appear in complete purity and never have to take a physical form again. That's not how the process of bodhisattva works. You know, it's taking the form and going through the process of limitation and that hard process of taking harmony through conflict, you know, from not knowing to knowing is how everything gets enlightened. Yeah, so that's it. it's going to happen that way with me. But you need to understand we all reincarnate so I'm going to reincarnate just like all the other Tibetans, yeah? And I'm reincarnating in that process, and you're going to reincarnate in that process, and I'm not in Tibet, yeah? I'm not going to say I'm Tibetan or something, yeah? I'm me, yeah? So every time I come back, you're going to be looking for this guy, yeah? Who's Jesus Christ, who knows he's Jesus Christ, and he's all these other lives in the past, yeah? And that's something that all of us are going to be aware of when we reincarnate. We're not going to be focused on a religion from mom or dad or you're born a Jew, kid. You know, oh, really? That's how it works. I'm born a Jew. I'm born a Catholic. You know, I'm born a Muslim. There's no choice in the matter. It's not like there's anything of this. You know, I'm born this way. You know, so it's not going to ever happen again. You know, this whole thing of being born anything is out of the question. Yeah. And that as I can continue reincarnating, I purify people enough to where they can walk away from those vices. And they can say, look, I know the Pope is wrong. I know the Catholic priests are wrong. I never want to go back to that church again. And I know being a Muslim, my father's going to kill me for stepping away. But I'd rather die this time and come back a Christian then live the life I'm going to live because I know I'm going to resurrect. I know Christ is going to take me back. I know this. Yeah. You know, so that's, I'm going to teach that to everybody and everybody's going to get that. Yeah. So by the year 2050, this is going to be pretty solid in the minds of very dogmatic Hindi people, very dogmatic Jewish people, very dogmatic, you know, everybody, people who don't believe in God and people who do believe in God. There's a lot I got to get through to get people to God. Yeah, you know, so just be patient because it, I, I'm the Lord of time and I've got all the time in the world. Yeah, but the main thing is to to get rid of all the things that are preset for your demise that you've been through in the past. And it is continually set up again for much worse things to happen. And none of those things are going to happen. None of those. Yeah, you know? and they're in your consciousness. Because you all have psychic abilities to get a sense of what's going to happen in the future, which is very similar to things that happened in the past, and that takes away your faith. Yeah, you don't have much hope in the future because it's, you don't have a future. Yeah, you know. So I'm creating a future. You will have, eliminating this process, so that as you continue reincarnating, you'll have more faith in the fact that it's okay to reincarnate. Look forward 
to reincarnate. There's not an alternative to reincarnating. This world's a good world. I trust in this world. There's no more Satan anymore. It's all over with. Yeah? All right. So, let's take it easy. Enjoy. <laughs>